and how it's going to be positioned. Now, it's also important to know what your telescope is going to look like when it's all set up, because sometimes you might forget to tighten something or you might forget to add something onto it, um, which means that it might not function the way it is, especially if you're not using it as a manual telescope, if you're using it um, when it's power function and it's tracking the night sky. It's important that you've got everything tightened and tensioned well, or else um, the gears will slip and it just won't track the night sky as you want to. It's going to lose alignment over the course of the night. So these are some of the things to keep in your mind. So that's well, what we're going for today. Things fall off into the tall grass that's just below you. Yeah, that can happen yeah. too. Um, find a place where there is no tall grass and that it's clear completely and you can see the ground. Um, Next thing you might want to check out is you've got eyepieces and they've got a whole bunch of numbers on them. What do they mean? Um, some might say 12 millimeters, some might say 25 millimeters. Um, the easiest way to think about these eyepieces is that it helps you with your magnification or how much you want to zoom in or zoom out. Alright? Um, it's to do with focal length, but um, we'll skip the science part of it. But the easiest way to go through it is that the higher the number is on your eyepiece, the lower the magnification is going to be, the more you're going to be zoomed out. The lower the number is on your eyepiece, so say for example you've got like a 7 millimeter or an 8 millimeter or a 9 millimeter eyepiece, it means you're going to have a really zoomed in image that you're dealing with. Okay? So kind of the opposite. So the bigger the number, the more zoomed out, the smaller the number, the more zoomed in. Alright? So it has to do with magnification. Alright, so you're ready and you're prepped and you're out there and you want to go and you say, cool, I don't know the sky, what should I be able to see tonight? So a little bit of um, planning and prep is required. Um, it's also important to know what your expectation might be and what the reality might be of the object that you're looking at. For example, Centaurus A, when you look at it through, um, you know, those amazing Google images, it's going to look fantastic and colourful and really vibrant. And then as soon as you look at it through a telescope, that's a bit much, to be honest. You, you don't see that. You see like a little dark blur and you see some glowing bits on top of the bottom. It's um, sometimes known as the Hamburger Galaxy as well because it just looks like a neat, dark, neat bit, and you've got your two buns on one side. So it's important to know what you might be expecting, and what you might actually be meant to be seeing through a telescope, because that could be two different things. Alright, so how do I plan my night? How do I plan what kind of objects I want to look at? How do I plan um, what are the different things that are going to be available for me? Because say, for example, we're dealing with cloudy patches like this, you want to have options for things that you can look at. So the um, website that I really like to use is called inthesky.org um, slash what's up, what's up. And what you can do is you can set the date, you can set the time, you can set um, what location you want it to be in as well. And the great thing is that you can also say, I only kind of want to see objects bright objects, not objects that are too faint. So this shows me stars down to magnitude 3.5. Now, when you're talking about magnitude, um, the smaller the number, the brighter the object's going to be. The higher the number of your magnitude, the dimmer and fainter the object is going to be. We can, with the naked eye, see hmm, maybe max up to 7 magnitude. Um, but if you're looking through a telescope, you might be able to push that just a little bit more. And what inthesky.org does for you is, it gives you a star chart. And then on the side, it tells you all the planets, the clusters, the galaxies, and the globular clusters that you can also maybe have a look at. And it gives you an idea of where that, um, those objects are going to be over the course of the night. So it might be a good idea to plan maybe what constellations you want to look at, maybe how you're going to find these objects, especially if you're going to go um, the manual route, which is my favorite uh, way to do it. How are you going to start hop? What are you going to be your um, sort of point 
pictures in the sky that you would go to and then navigate your way around. So really good helpful site, especially if you did want to um, have a go out, out there. So you're ready to get out there, ready to get started. How's it looking? Writing. <laughs> oh, wow. Not really heavy, it's just very thin drizzle, but it might, it might pass over. <laughs> Sounds pretty rainy. Man, yeah. you don't fit. That was real touching yesterday, huh? Alright, so you're ready to get out there. <laughs> First thing, check, check the weather forecast and the moon phases. So, the reason why I said check the moon phases is the moon, even though it's amazing to look at and it's beautiful, it is probably one of your biggest sources of light pollution. It makes it really hard for you to actually look at a lot of deep sky objects, um, just because of how much it brightens the sky. So it's really good to know when the moon is rising, when the moon is setting. Maybe you want to talk to the moon just as it's going, you know, setting, and then you get dark sky for the rest of the night. That's kind of ideal. Or you're having a dark night, and then the moon sort of rises a little bit later on, and goes back to end. So that way you have an idea of how to set up your timings as well. Um, make sure you keep yourselves warm. It's getting warm now, so it's not really as applicable, but hot coffee or hot chocolate helps, and pocket warmers, gloves that allow movement, um, and sometimes you might need your like, sensitive pad touches on your pinpoint. And don't wear cotton socks, because um, you sweat and it gets cold and you get cold feet. Alright. <laughs> I'm wearing cotton socks now. <laughs> Alright, so you're ready to set up for the night and you want to go. How do you get started? Um, it's ideal that you get started when there is still a little bit light out there. So starting to start the sunset is a good idea because you get about half an hour to 45 minutes of still some of that daylight remaining. Um, it's a great way to make sure that you have your location scouted, you've got your area clear, you're not in like surrounded by tall grass where things can fall and go missing, um, and you can also get yourself set up for that. Um, the location is going to be important, and then it's also a great time for you to also set up your telescope and align your microscope as well. Now your fine scope is going to be your biggest sort of tool, your best friend to use over the course of the night, and it's really important that you get that set up and aligned right at the start, um, because it just gives you a wider field view of what you're looking at and helps you just narrow it down um, if you're trying to find something very faint or very specific. Now the easiest um, or the best way to find a line you find a I feel is that you look at a tree really, really far away and that tree is not going to be moving and you can point your telescope in that direction and get it in your eyepiece and you can line the finest scope so that it's also looking at the same area and because it's not constantly shifting because of the uh, spinning, it's a really easy way to get your finest scope aligned with the telescope. If the moon is out, you can also use the moon because it's such an easy object to find. But like I said, it's better to use something that's not moving to align your finest scope. Um, as it's getting darker, it's super important that you orientate yourself and you know where you're looking. Where's south, where's north, where's east? Because that's going to make it a lot easier for you to know, well, if this is south, then I know I should be able to see a few things in here, especially knowing where the southern cross is going to be, etc. Um, and that's going to be really helpful. <coughs> and then the other thing is, sometimes you might have um, a very special object that you want to look at. So for example, you want to have a look at the Great Orion Nebula. Can you guys figure out what is it going to be visible at the time of year that I'm looking for? Because if you're looking at it during the middle of winter, you're going to have to wait till very, very, very early in the morning to be able to see it, maybe. Alright? So, it's super important that you understand how the sky works and that if there's a particular thing that you want to see, is it going to be visible or not? Those star charts really help. Last thing, have your red torches handy because the last thing you want to do is to whip out your phone to have a look at something on your phone and blind yourself because remember when it's dark out there, your pupils are dilating they're getting as big as they can so that they can get in as much light as possible. As soon as you look at a bright screen, your eyes are going to react and your pupils are going to contract. 
and it's going to make it a lot harder for you to get yourself nice adapted. For adults, it could take up to 20 minutes. The older you are, the longer it takes for your eyes to adjust to actually let all that light in. Alright, so you're all there, you've got the telescope set up. I can't find the object. Alright. First things first, are you looking at the right place? Alright, sometimes you might just think that you're looking in a certain direction and this has happened to me and you haven't orientated yourself in the right way, it can happen. Making sure your telescope and your finderscope is aligned is super important as well. Because remember, your finderscope is your best friend. It's going to give you that wide field, wide field view so that you can slowly kind of um, come into a more focused area of the sky. Um, it's also important that when you are looking through a telescope to start with a low magnification eyepiece and then move into high magnification eyepieces. Remember, high magnification are those smaller numbers, it really zoomed in. So if you're trying to find this one tiny star in this giant sky, it's going to be a lot harder if you're really, really zoomed in. So make sure that you're using a low magnification eyepiece so that you're really sort of getting a wider field of view, and then if you need to, zoom yourself in. Um, now, manual versus go-to. This just means that maybe your telescope needs realigning, it's lost its alignment over the course of the night, and now it's not tracking well. So if it's a manual scope, it's really easy, you just swing it wherever you want to. But if it's a scope that's tracking over the course of the night, you've got to make sure that it's maintaining that tracking. Sometimes it could be as simple as your battery is getting really cold and it's not doing the job that it's supposed to do and keeping your telescope powered up. So that way, maybe you can be losing your light as well. Just little things like that that can come up over the course of the night that you just need to be aware of. Um, but it's kind of like a trial and error thing. As you go out there and you do it a couple of times, you figure out all these different things that can work or don't work. All right. The image is blurry and I can't see it to focus on what I'm looking at. Now there's a few things that can happen here, or a few reasons why this might be. One is, maybe try changing your eyepiece. Now, remember how I said you have your different types of eyepieces and you're zooming in at different levels? Um, sometimes using a very zoomed out eyepiece, say for example, looking at might be the best way to observe and enjoy Saturn. So they're using maybe your 18mm or your 25mm eyepieces. The more you zoom in and the more you get down to those really high magnification eyepieces, you're now also increasing the amount of distortion that you're seeing in the sky as well. So it's just learning to figure out, maybe for this particular object, what's the best type of eyepiece to be using? Because just because you want to zoom in, and you want to get that high magnification, might not necessarily be the best idea to enjoy it. All right? So try changing your eyepieces if it's kind of thing to focus it. That might do the job. All right? Another thing that could be an issue might be the seeing. Now the seeing is just a way that astronomers sort of use, or the word that astronomers use to determine how much disturbances there are in the atmosphere. So the light coming from these distant stars and planets, when they hit our atmosphere, ideally, you would love for them to go straight through. But there's a lot of turbulences, lots of different pressures, and because of that, the light doesn't come straight through, it sort of does a bit of a wobble. And because of that, images might not actually look very clear when you're looking at it. If it's still, if it's crisp and clear, and you look straight up, you'll notice that the stars go into twinkle as much, that's a good sign. If they're not twinkling much and they're not doing a lot of movement, it means that you're likely to get a good, still, clear, clear image. But if it's super twinkly and it's super distorted, especially if it's, say, closer to the horizon, you're more likely to see Jupiter look like that rather than being able to see those bands coming across. Cool? The last thing, <laughs> is, is there dew on your telescope? Um, sometimes you don't realize that you might be looking from one end of the telescope, but if you go around to the other side, it's actually collected a lot of dew just because of the way the temperature has shifted or um, changed over 
the cause of the lag. Um, and if it's really, really cold, you can also frost. To do that, don't lick it, try to warm up, don't breathe on it or do anything. The best thing to do is to use a hairdryer. A hairdryer does the um, job really, really well. The last thing you want to do is take a rag and just oh. clean it because that's going to do um, terrible things to your um, mirror and your um, pieces here and your objects. So don't touch it. Use a hairdryer. It does a good job of getting that water and moisture to evaporate. And the good thing to do is the next, the next time you're going out there is to use a dew shield. And it's literally just you can use a yoga mat if you want to and just wrap it around the top of it and tape it. You could get dew shields um, when you get your telescope and they come in. Some of them are even heated. You have the option to plug it into your telescope if it's um, power operated. And that way it keeps your telescope um, optics looking quite nice. So you have options of how to reduce that. And then the last thing for tonight before we end, hopefully we can go and see if it's going to be better, is that your telescope might be out of collimation. Um, now, this just tells me, if I was to unfocus, um, I would say, for example, I'm looking at some stars, and they're kind of looking like they have a bit of a tail going on, mm -hmm. um, and they're not looking like round dots like they should be, um, it could be because of collimation. And that just means that your primary mirror and your secondary mirror Right? They're not aligned properly and they're not talking to each other like they should be and they're not sending light the way that they should. So sometimes it's just that one needs to be shifted a little bit and moved around. It's probably best you bring it in and get Steve or Darren to take a look at it and they might be able to do the collimation for you if you're doing it for the first time. Um, but once you get it perfectly collimated and you sort of defocus your eyepiece, your star should look perfectly concentric like this, a circle, but if that inner donut is sort of shifted off to a side, you know that there's something going wrong with your um, mirrors. Alright, so these are things that um, you want to be aware of and keep an eye out for when you are prepping for a night out. What I have done is, oh, super quickly, why can't you use the rag or tissue on the, on, on the telescope? To wipe it off. So say for example, um, telescopes collect a lot of dust, especially if you're using it um, outside. And if you have something, even though you're wiping it very, very softly, as soon as you move it, it's going to create a little scratch on your um, on your little mirror or your little objects. So it's just yeah. So it's just best not to touch it at all and to try and get it, um, get the moisture out of the hairdryer. But if you do want it cleaned, there are people who can actually help you with cleaning your telescope out, because it does collect dust and dirt over a while. It doesn't make a big difference to your viewing, um, really, unless it's like super dirty and super grungy. And if that's the case, bring it in, get someone here to check it out, and they should be able to give you some pro opinions as to how to get yourself fixed. Now, what I've done is, I have made for you guys a star chart. Um, I literally um, screenshotted the um, inthesky.org star chart, um, but the University of Canterbury also has star charts, and Stardo also has star charts if you go online to check out, check them out, um, and get comfortable with what sort of star charts you're comfortable reading as well. Um, I really like these ones, but that's just a personal preference. And what I've done is um, I've noted a few objects for you to take a look at on one side. And on the back of it, I've given you some information about the objects, so, such as their designation, um, which constellation you can find them in, what type of object you're looking at. And I've ordered it in terms of magnitude. So the brightest objects are on top. They're the ones that should be easier to find. And the lower magnitude objects are on the bottom. So it should go from like easier to harder. And then I've given you also an idea of what to expect. This is my best Google Images um, search of what it should look like if you're looking at it through a telescope, not those like grand Hubble images. So take a look at this. This is for, this is set up for 9 o'clock tonight, 9.02 tonight. That's what 
time that I set it for. So um, have a look at this and see if you can go outside and you can orientate yourself. You might need to use your, your, your phone to help you find it, but maybe it'll help you find some of the bright objects and the stars in the sky. And then you can have a go at figuring out how you might want to find some of these deep sky objects that I've got for you. Um, some of them are a little bit harder to find. They're right on the edge, which means they're right on the horizon. Might be best for, uh, to wait for a while for them to rise and then use them sort of for your later in the night um, observing. But here you go. Um, I will pass these around. When you, when you use a star track, you hold it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then hold it down. You hold it down. So you just need to disguise it. Need to know. Um, sorry, there's, a, there's a few. There's a take one, pass it along. Oh yeah, true. Uh, right. Next week, we need to plan something fun. Maybe we can. Twice today too. If you miss it at nine, I think it's coming out. What? What's What's happening? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> and next weekend, maybe we can try Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, and Friday night. Are you going to like that? Cross.